Okay, great. Um, so next up we have uh, Mahmoud, and uh, I think many of you people probably uh, know him or have heard of him, but he's a PSF fellow. He um, has presented at numerous conferences, Pi Bay, and et cetera, et cetera. He has awesome lists. He has been on um, podcasts um, and is now creating a, uh, some open source software. And he is uh, creating a, um, I guess, a new capability that is putting Python in the browser. So he's going to tell you about that. So take it over, Mahmoud. Hey, everybody. Love that auction energy. And it's good to be back in person. It's good to see you all again. Yeah, give yourself another hand of applause. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, J James, like, you know, sort of got carried away, like, uh, introducing me and my talk. But I'll do it again. So here's me. Uh, my name is Mahmoud. I'm uh, on extended parental leave at the moment. Uh, here's baby Mina uh, down at Pacifica. Um, so, yeah, like, I saw a couple hands that didn't go up when you said you use Python. So it, there's, a, there's a pretty good chance that they don't know me, James. So, uh, yeah, I, <laughs> I maintain awesome Python applications, which is like an awesome list, but it's of all these open source applications. Sentry is absolutely one of them. Uh, there's a big difference between like a heavily used library versus like a full-bodied application, like I'm going to tell you about today. Um, I also do calver.org and uh, uh, satirical zeroverorg So if you have any libraries that uh, are 0 0.22 for like years, um, like whether it's pandas or pyiodide, like I'm going to talk about today, um, you can uh, you know list them on zeroverorg I'll probably see your PR sometime in the next few months. Um, and then, yeah, I have some other like libraries with a few uh, thousand stars, Boltons and uh, Glom, which is what I'm going to talk to you about today. I'm working on something new, um, and this talk is going to be sort of about the run-up to that, uh, but it's something completely different. So going back to the title of the talk, um, I'm like a back-end developer primarily. I've worked uh, at PayPal and uh, a bunch of startups, Y Combinator and Stripe. So. Um, and it's always been like mostly a back-end capacity, like except for the first couple of years where I was full stack, right? I sort of specialized in this back-end. Um, but I started a project last year that sort of started to change that, and I launched it, let's say, today. You can visit it at yak.party slash glompad. It's called glompad. Yak.party is just a fun URL I had. And so, um, but yeah, it's, uh, it's interesting. It is a... Uh, Python front-end software. So I'm going to need another tab. Um, does Control-T do that? Like, how does that work? <laughs> let's, see. Uh, so let's see. I just want to make sure it works. Can I keep going? No? Yeah, I need yeah. So yeah, I'm Yak uh, Party. I'm hoping that I'm like in an address bar. <laughs> no. Okay. There you go. Sure. Oh, right here. So we're looking for Chrome. That's okay. Um, Yak dot Party, and then we'll go from there. Arty, Arty, Arty. All right. Okay. So yeah, I can navigate from here. I have a Discord as well. If you want to yell about uh, yell about this later. Okay, so there it is, and it respects the browser settings, so we're in dark mode automatically. Um, yeah, so you may have seen it pop up there, but uh, the main thing I want to do here, I realize it's a bit small, so let's go ahead and uh, zoom in. Zoom in work? Yeah, everyone just get to, oh no, I don't want to do that. <laughs> Control plus. Oh because it's a Windows keyboard on a Mac. Oh my goodness. It is unholy. I never want to enable dictation. All right. Um, OK, so you're just going to have to take the take a word. Well, you want to give it a shot? I'll try OK. No, 
we're there. there we we're go. there. Okay. It's so good, right? All right. So um, I'm gonna I'm gonna explain what all this means, but you're gonna have to uh, take my word for it when I say that this is uh, going to be um, Python, and so uh, this is a Glom spec. I'm gonna put some data in here, like hello. Let's make it lowercase. Hello, SF Python, like a hello world, right? And then when I hit Control Enter, not Command Enter. Ta-da, it ran. So it's not super, super crazy, but what's going on behind the scenes may surprise you. Stay tuned. So, but t.title, one thing for sure, that's not JavaScript. JavaScript string types don't have title method. Uh, and they definitely don't have, let's see, uh, they definitely don't have, let's see, there was a new one, uh, dot swap case. Yeah, who, who knew that Python string had swap case now? OK, anyways, uh, <laughs> everything old is new again. So I'm just going to get back to my slides here. Yay, so the demo worked. OK, so uh, I'm not done demoing. What happened behind the scenes was we were running a Python uh, runtime uh, inside of the browser. And now I'm going to run Python like inside of my presentation. Uh, so. You know, I've embedded a REPL in here, and when I hit Control Enter, you can see the first 15 modules as loaded by this browser tab. So, for those of you who raised your hand that you use Python, uh, now you can use Python in your browser. Who's done this before? A couple people, actually. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, so who knew it was possible? Everyone thought it was possible, and yet you didn't try. But it's so easy. Aside, like the hardest part was the keyboard. Okay, so <laughs> anyways, uh, yeah, so we're going to cover a lot of ground, uh, hopefully. Yes, there we go. Here's the roadmap. So we're going to talk, we're going to rewind a bit and talk about declarative data transformation. Then we're going to talk about GLOMPAD, which is what you saw a moment ago. That's GLOM in a nutshell. And then I'm going to talk about learnings about building that over the last couple months. And then we're going to talk about web history, and not your web history, but just web history in general. Um, and then we're going to talk about how you can actually make this happen today. Um, so I know a lot of you are uh, Python aficionados. Um, any of you work with data? OK, yeah. No, I mean, where would we be without data in the Python world? We would be somewhere in like the purgatory of where Perl found itself between five and six. Right? Data saves the life of Python. But one real thing about data is that it doesn't really fit on slides, first of all, I have to say. So it looks like this. I'm not going to zoom in. Real data looks like this. This is even a sanitized, boiled down version of a real data structure that I had. So real world data is very involved. It's very nested. And uh, so um, after a few years of working with real world data at PayPal, uh, I ended up developing a little utility called get path, and you give it a, a root data object, like this one here, three nested dictionaries, two nested lists, and you give it a list of keys to access, and then it'll access it for you. Not much to it, right? Why would I want to do this? The answer is better errors. So if I were to do this in Python, I might save a few characters, root a, b, c, two, one, but then if it's not the right index, I get back index error. So which one failed? Which index was out of range? Was it the two out of range or the one out of range? If you see this in production, you're going to be pulling your hair out that you didn't write a test and like, you know, it's, it's going to be a mess. Um, unless you, I'm getting to that part. <laughs> yes, if you have Sentry, you might be in a slightly different position. But you'd be in an even better position if you used get path uh, because it would at least tell you that it couldn't access the two from that path. You know, that's something valuable. So. That was 2015, and this was a somewhat popular utility. It's part of the Boltons package. People would import it and open issues on it and stuff. But we were really just getting started. So in 2018, this concept outgrew Boltons and uh, became this library called GLOM. And GLOM had a single function, and you would call that function with a path, which could now be a string separated by dots for even more readability, and it would get you your value back. And uh, this might not seem like that fancy of a thing, but it, was, it would at least intelligently choose between accessing keys and accessing attributes and accessing indexes based on the 
object that you were targeting. So, uh, you know, it's pretty neat. This deep get functionality is still the main reason people use Glom today. I, I think there are probably tons of people who, in, who import Glom that don't even realize that there is other functionality. But I'm going to tell you, there is other functionality. <laughs> so um, you do this Glom calling enough times, and some of us were getting tired of typing like glom.glom, .glom, and so you would uh, basically, instead of having a bunch of Glom calls here, you could do a dictionary or a data structure that would have the paths as the values. So you'd have the keys as you wanted them and the paths as the values, and you'd only make one Glom call. Uh, so in this case, I want to build a new object that has just the ID and date out of this nested object, data, ID, date, name. So output of that, as you would expect, it's just an object, ID to date 1999. Good year. Um, but it did that recursively, so it composed really well. And you could have specs that were part of other specs, and especially if you're just shoveling data from one API into another API, or if you're sanitizing something or something like that, it's a really useful and terse data operator. So we call this de declarative data transformation. And there's actually a company, a few companies, that do this sort of thing now as a service. I forgot to get on that train. Uh, I didn't raise any uh, rounds on, on top of Glom's uh, myriad stars on GitHub. But basically, uh, it's like templates for your data. So if you're used to rendering a Django template Right, and you're spitting out like a data structure to an HTML file. Uh, it's like that, except you're going from data structure to data structure. It gives you smaller, better code, and it gives you fewer, better errors. And so this year, we, we're still developing it, and we've come out with a lot of new features. I'm going to do a rundown of these features just so I can overwhelm you. Um, <laughs> so uh, one thing is you can have star paths now. Everyone wanted them. They want stars. So they can pretend that like their data structures are like their file system and search for star.txt. They want glob, like you can do a git ignore type thing. It's there now. Uh, A.star.k will single level search for all objects with a k in it. Um, and then if you do star star.k, it's going to search recursively for the whole data structure, and you just get back everything that matches that key. There's now also deep assignment. So it's not just for deep gets. It's not just for making new objects. Let's say you load up something from an XML file, and you have this nasty element tree-like data structure, and you just want to change one thing and re-output it again. Maybe it's HTML5 lib, and you're doing this with the DOM or something. Um, now you can do that. So with deep assignment, you say uh, assign to target a.1.d, assign value e, and this none, boom, becomes the value e. And it doesn't create new objects or anything like that. It just surgically looks at what type of object it is and assigns to it. So it'll assign to lists, it'll assign to objects, it'll assign to dictionaries. It knows how to use that sort of thing. It uses set other versus like setting the key appropriately. And then after a couple of years, we also for realized we forgot to do deletion. So uh, now you can delete stuff too. Uh, so also when you're dealing with data, sometimes it doesn't all fit into memory. Python has a beautiful generator thing. So we made a generator composition uh, syntax. So you can, um, you know, in a streaming fashion, filter and then create a unique list of all the objects out of that list. Streaming is supported. Why not? And we even support pattern matching before it was cool. So uh, now, like, you can basically do data validation with Glom before you do your data, data manipulation. Um, so here we're just validating that we match the shape. The data matches the shape of a list of objects with ID and email as keys and int and stir as, as the types, respectively. So. Um, now, what's really cool, uh, and this is, I think, where we're actually breaking new ground. Some of this other stuff is all just really convenient to have in one package, but one thing that I haven't seen anyone else do is we have even better errors. That was where it all started, right? Good errors. So we'll add a piece of bad data. This one is really sneaky. It has a numeric, like, you know, ID still, but it's a string and not an integer. So we add that to our previous data structure, then we run our match on it, and we get back a type match error. But you'll notice it's not your usual Python stack trace with tons of file paths and line numbers telling you what the problem is. Instead, it's a different kind of stack. It's what we call the data trace. And here it tells you that it, recurred down, it recursively walked down your data structure looking at this target, then this spec, then this spec, then this target, et cetera, et cetera, until it ran 
out of things to look at, and it was looking at for an integer, but it found the string three. And so you get a lot of context, much shorter, love Sentry, love stack frames, love this stuff, but this is a little bit more readable, and it works with Sentry too. Okay, anyways. So here, here you can see, like, there was an actual version where we changed this behavior, and are stack traces part of your API? Up for debate, up for debate. I think a really good library will think about the stack traces outputs, but for the most part, people weren't mad that we broke our stack trace API. It used to look like this, and now it looks like this. So it's just a lot more readable and a lot more actionable than your average API. So I know what all of you are thinking. You're like, how much more of this talk is left? Let me get out of here and let me just try Glom today. Well, good news for you, there are docs, and you can see all the other features because this is still just the tip of the iceberg. But there was a problem, uh, and it's glom.read the docs. Uh, so, uh, but there's a problem. It's like kind of a lot, right? And so I'm like, okay, I'll fix this. I'll make a tutorial. There's a tutorial in the docs. And you can even, from glom, import tutorial, and there's a module, and you can walk along with the docs tut tutorial and try it out for yourself using your Python REPL. Take it a step further. And you can actually do it with REPL.IT. Anyone use REPL.IT? Okay, a few people, okay. So you can do Python in the browser. You can even do Python in the Glom docs. And I'm just going to talk right now while we wait for uh, Poetry to install and then for uh, my dependencies to install. And then now Glom has finally installed. And there we go. So there is like it having run. I don't know if anyone timed it. But it takes a little bit of time for it to run. It wasn't as slick as I wanted. And I was wondering, is that the reason why more people aren't using Glom? Who knows? Um, so anyways, uh, but to be clear, there is some friction with using a more powerful tool like Glom. There's a learning curve. And I compare it to regular expressions. I don't need to ask. I'm sure you've all used regular expressions. And we all have the scars to show for it. So, uh, but we still end up using it because at the end of the day, sometimes you're very thankful you didn't have to write your own parser and like, you know, remembering automata and like NFAs and all this stuff. Anyways, uh, so there's, but there is density and there's context switching. So this is where Glompad comes in. For all of those dedicated Glom users out there, I wanted them to have the ability to iteratively play with their gloms and like get it right in the browser and then switch back to using their, their code. So the design is in, inspired by these three characters, right? This is probably maybe where some of you started coding. You ran Python and you saw the three angle brackets, maybe four if you're really weird and ran PyPy. Um, but uh, I, I just want to take a moment so everyone here can appreciate that Python may not have been the first one to have the read-evaluate print loop, the REPL. But out of Python came IPython. And out of IPython came IPython Notebook, which they called Jupyter. And from Jupyter, we got this whole tree of other things, like um, everything from Zeppelin to Observable. You know, there were entire companies that were effectively founded by the shift uh, into this notebook approach. And Python played a really big role in that shift. So. Um, you know, and we have a lot to thank for them. So, but yeah, we're in good company with Glompad, uh, me and the whole crew of me. And then uh, we've got JS Fiddle, Compiler Explorer, Regex 101, and Code Sandbox. I'm sure some folks here have used these ones. Yeah, you could just jump right in and use Glompad now, no problem. All right, so let's talk about some features. First of all, it's mobile first. You could be using it now, what's wrong with you? Uh, so it's, uh, yeah, it, it'll fit on your phone, it has like a menu that'll collapse and so forth. Um, it has other features too though. So key among them is that it has a shareable URL. So when people report issues, now they can go set up the problem on a Glom pad and then they can come share the URL in the issue tracker. Uh, I can also link to it from the docs. <laughs> uh, you can copy the data to your clipboard, you can copy the URL to your clipboard. I sort of want to demo this, but I also don't want to mess with the tabs too much. There's dark mode, as we saw. This is P0 if you're making a dev tool. You can't launch a dev tool in 2023 and not have dark mode. Um, and there's optional black auto formatting. Uh, so who here uses black auto formatting things? Cool. That launched the Peninsula. You should come to the meetup. It's just a little bit south of here. Okay. Uh, and then there's a whole bunch of examples on the left as well. 
that can sort of walk you through the progressively com more complicated things you can do with GLOM. And so, uh, you know, this is sort of the architecture diagram for GLOM and why this talk exists. So it's basically impossible for, like I was not going to port GLOM to JavaScript to have people try it out, right? Um, but at the same time, I wanted best in class JavaScript, TypeScript uh, tools and libraries uh, to build GLOMPAD with. I didn't want to have to port uh, Code Mirror, which is doing the, um, you know, all the good like uh, highlighting and indenting and so forth. Uh, I didn't want to have to port that to Python. So um, GLOMPAD's architecture is such that there's GLOMPAD.py, which is the business logic that I wrote. That's on top of libraries like Black. I'm not going to port like Black's auto formatting to JavaScript. That runs on top of PyScript, which runs on top of PyIodide and MicroPip. And then WebAssembly gets the browser to do our bidding. <sighs> Communication is over uh, basically a Svelte store. And when you Svelte, OK, so it's like React, but better. Um, <laughs> and I say that having used both extensively now. Um, and so I'm using TypeScript. I'm using Svelte. That's on top of Code Mirror, which is a super cool, powerful code editing uh, you know, toolkit. Um, and then I use the JavaScript library for Sentry and like the Svelte integration. Uh, Svelte and Rollup, uh, which does the build. And then there's TypeScript, which of course has to be rolled up into JavaScript, which is then what your browser runs. So I'm getting the best of both worlds. I, I don't have to port Black to JavaScript. I don't have to port Code Mirror to Python, right? Why choose? Two great flavors that go together. Um, I just saw there's someone with a PyScript shirt in the, in, the <laughs> in the audience. Hopefully, I'm doing it justice so far. All right, so highlights from this experience. First of all, like, I just got to say it again. It actually works. You saw it boot up. It, it loads faster than mo most medium blog posts that I read, right? Like, it takes like under five seconds to load, you know, like towards data science. How about like towards data, you know? <laughs> Anyways, uh, so PyIodide, like, yeah, PyScript, Svelte, TypeScript, and Python are like all playing together. And if there's bugs, they're my bugs and not their bugs. Like, I, you know, I didn't know that this would work going in, and it seems like having not seen more hands go up when I said, have you run Python in the browser, many of you suspect it wouldn't either. But it actually does. You can build a spa in Python in 2023. That's single page application. Uh, OK. And it's more fun than React, like I said. Uh, the development loop is tight. I really enjoy Svelte. Uh, great community, uh, plus uh, great integration with Rollup and Vite. Vite is like, yeah, just my dev server, and it does things quickly. It has plugins, yada, yada. Um, it's mostly from the view side of things, but it works really well with Svelte. So um, I see some people like, you know, giving me side eye, like, why are you doing so much JavaScript? Man? Well, the fact is, I don't want to run a backend. I don't want people taking over my Python backend that is only existing to run a single GLOM function in order to, like, you know, mine crypto and, uh, like, you know, basically DDoS, uh, you know, whatever Mastodon instance they're mad at right now, right? And so, you know, this is all happening in your browser, and that means that it's relatively secure, at least from my perspective. It's also, surprisingly, relatively stable. So we're still talking about the front end ecosystem, but. I had to upgrade three times to get the, you know, certain bugs fixed and so forth. And yes, everything broke. It, the app stopped working. But twice it was because of JavaScript, only once because of Python, you know? That's pretty good. That's relative stability, if you ask me. So I do have some advice, since some of you look really eager. I see some people pulling out their laptops, you know, get cloning the, the PyScript uh, repo. Uh, OK, so write your own build script. It's going to come in really handy. So one of the features that GLOMPAD has is you can switch between GLOM versions. And the way I'm enabling that is sort of using pip download to download a complete set of wheels that matches what you would have had at the time that that GLOM version came out. And this way you could see the GLOM functionality over time, reproduce old errors, that kind of thing. The build script is what makes that happen. Vite and Rollup are cool, but wrap them. It'll come in handy for things like integrating Sentry. So uh, I promise I didn't get any compensation to say this, but like Sentry is an open source tool, and it's very cool. They uh, sponsor open source. And if you're building an application like this, my advice is just manually test it, <laughs> add Sentry, and then ship it. And if there are any bugs, let your users find them. <laughs> <laughs> 
they're not they're not paying they're not paying me to develop this thing. So uh, you know there have been a couple of bugs right over here, and then uh, you know the Sentry came in, and I was like, oh yeah, duh, and then I fixed it and shipped it. And there's even a uh, pr you know you'll notice this one here. It says production Sentry test, and this is the real sort of Easter egg. There is a debug mode that you can enable in the options in Glompad, and it opens up some debug examples, such as URLs that load very slowly or ones that have bad JSON associated with them. You can see the internal state of the application, and it also gives you a button where you can send me sentry issues. Don't do it. <laughs> Don't press the button. Uh, no, it's fine. You can press the button. Okay. So um, now lowlights. You know, we have lots of fun, but uh, it's not all perfect. Right? We had some bad days too. So package support, be aware that it only supports wheels. And so if you're pure Python, you're going to be fine, by and large. Uh, I did have an old version of Glom that was only a Python 2 wheel, and I pushed a new one that was for an old version of Python. I had like five people show up in my issue tracker saying that I've been supply chain compromised. I'm like, no, sometimes you just push an old wheel. It's fine. Um, but uh, the, everyone was relieved and happy. So. Uh, if it's not pure Python, you need to target mscripten. That's the WebAssembly uh, sort of builder thing. And uh, the good news is that because Anaconda and, and all these folks are backing PyScript, like you're going to find that most of the core data processing applications that have non-pure Python dependencies are going to be pre-built and work for you. So the NumPy, the SciPy, these things, they run in your browser too, even though Glompad doesn't use them. Playwright. I was kind of let down by this. Anyone heard of Playwright? Okay. I see like not a lot of smiles, so maybe I'm not the only one. Uh, they should reverse the order of the masks. So uh, it's basically Microsoft's answer to Selenium. It lets you do like sort of integration testing. And it was easy to get started. I'll give them credit. But it was kind of slow. And so I only ended up writing a few integration tests. And I think I'm going to have to do like, uh, you know, unit testing. <laughs> Anyways. Uh, <laughs> or just leave Sentry, right? Manual testing. And so, um, yeah, it turns out that according to an issue, Selenium might actually be faster for Firefox. Uh, keep that in mind, maybe, if you decide to do this. Docs, PyID.docs were good for reference. The PyScript docs have a really nice meta structure, separating guides and tutorials and so forth, but it's still very new. It only came out last year, so it hasn't been fleshed out yet. There are some JavaScript Python friction things, so everything gets wrapped in these proxy objects that you need to be a little bit careful about, uh, wrapping, unwrapping them. Basically, Glompad has memory leaks, I don't doubt it. Uh, so, but that's front end standard practice, right? Wouldn't be front end if we didn't leak memory. You know, you wouldn't get to make all your fun Chrome memes. It's good. Uh, hmm. So we got memory leaks. And there are other constraints. So check out this URL, PyIDide. It supports the vast majority of the Python standard library, but there are some things that don't really make sense to support. Um, OK. So also, infinite loops. Mm, I'm just going to say refresh your page. And then uh, <laughs> PyScript, uh, it was easy to get started, but ultimately PyDide has a lot more control, and PyScript is a pretty thin wrapper, more of a demo vehicle. I still use PyScript because it gives me a REPL when I enable debug mode, and I scroll down, the bottom portion of the screen is a REPL for me to do debugging of Glompad. Um, so I think that PyScript could, for instance, do more, like solve that interruptible issue, do web worker packaging for you, but oh well. Another weird thing about PyScript, they also use Svelte and Code Mirror, so I feel like some of my design decisions were validated. But at the same time, I got some really confusing errors where I thought I broke something, but it turns out PyScript did. Anyways, um, Svelte stores, not enough people use Svelte. I'll just say, mm, maybe look at one of the higher level Svelte stores as opposed to just the built-in one. Uh, otherwise, you might end up missing Redux, and that feels weird. Uh, Code Mirror 6 is way more complex than Code Mirror 5, um, but it's still very powerful. I would use it again, but you know, keep in mind, you might have to read some TypeScript. So, uh, and it's still front end, so be careful about upgrades. All right, so here's a fun part of the talk, hopefully. So uh, as, as David mentioned, right, like some of us have been in the industry for a while. Anyone been around for like 10 years in the Python world? OK, so this is going to be fun for you. And for the rest of you, this is going to be an important history lesson. Why is it different? Why is Python so late to the web front end party, right? Is it because there's something fundamentally flawed about Python? Well, it turns out that we have been, uh, you know, coming to the party like several times, and it's just that the party is a complete shit show, and only JavaScript wants to be at this party most of the time. So, um, so the first attempt at Python in the browser was called PyJS, also known as Pajamas, which is a much more fun name, but has not as good of a logo. Uh, it died in 2015, 
But this was the first one I remember having come to the industry. Maybe there were ones before that. Someone can fill me in. But it transpiles Python to JavaScript. So you write Python. It makes JavaScript out of that. You ship the JavaScript. That's transpilation. What's the difference between transpilation and compilation? Hmm. This is a question for you know PL types. It, it was a port of GWT, which was Google's web toolkit, which was used to build the first version of Gmail, the good version of Gmail. OK, um, Silverlight. Yeah, we're going to hang on that one for a second. So Microsoft, back when they were like, you know, still had the corporate momentum around IE6, like it made this thing called Silverlight. And it turns out it only died when IE11 died, like 2019, 2021. So it was, a long way long, it was around way longer than I expected. Um, but you could run Iron Python in the browser. Iron Python, it sounds strong. All right. <laughs> All right. But yeah, it died with IE11. It rusted. Um, no, no relation. Anyways, so uh, then there was this thing called Sculpt. Uh, and it, I guess it's still going today, but it's a very manual, like, built, like, transpiler. It's like a real sort of uh, hand-built thing. Um, it's only on Python 3.7 because they really struggled to make that 2 to 3 jump. But it's used by this one set of textbooks. So maybe if any of you went to University of Michigan or something like that, some of your first CS courses apparently used Python in the browser powered by Sculpt. I didn't know that, but GitHub told me so. Um, so, and it only has a partial standard library because every single standard library uh, thing is like manually ported. You know, that's the hand building that happens. Okay, mpython. This one only lasted for two years. Why is it here? It's because REPL.IT, which is now like a multi-million dollar, like, you know, VC-backed startup and so forth, got its start by bringing the REPL to the browser by using mscript in WebAssembly to bring Python to a REPL. So the things that powers my like uh, docs now, is not the same thing, but uh, it got its start there. And you can find this early version of Python and Scripten uh, still online, just archived. This has the same approach as PyIDID. The main thing is that you couldn't pip install anything. So what is Python without the ecosystem? Maybe a learning tool? Maybe a VC-backed startup? No, I'm joking. Um, OK, PyPyJS. So this one's really cool. Everything PyPy is cool, if you ask me, um, but it's no longer going, like they basically like would compile to JavaScript as the name suggests, uh, but it points to PyIDide. And there's Brython, this one's still going too, so, and it supports Python 3.11. Uh, so it also works via auto translation of CPython to JavaScript, but it does it at the sort of the C JavaScript level, not at the assembly level. Um, pretty neat. And then there's Transcript. This is also active-ish. Uh, it's like PyJS in that it doesn't ship the whole interpreter, so you don't get eval. <laughs> like a lot of things aren't going to work if you don't have eval. And then, so you get the Python syntax, but no ecosystem, so you don't get pip. So they do have a thing called pyreact.com, which will teach you how to use React with Python syntax, which sounds like e there's just no way that medicine's going down easy. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like React, folks. <laughs> All right. Uh, okay. But then there's another thing called Rapid Script, which I like the name a little bit better because it has a Pi in it. Um, it seems less cryptic, but uh, it's, mm, I don't know. Also, don't get Pi React confused with the Pi React IDOM thing. I think maybe it's React Pi. But if you haven't checked out IDOM, someone has made like a port of React to Python for use in Jupyter. Building things. I don't know. I thought it was kind of cool. Um, <laughs> anyways, uh, is it worth it? So we did all these iterations, right? Like how many like bodies, how many lines of code, right? Like how much have we given up to get Python into the browser? And are we there yet? I say yes. I built this single page application. It actually works. It loads fine. I, I have timings in the like little pills, the status pills, like it's fast. It's about four times slower than my terminal, but we're talking about a front end, right? It doesn't need to be all that fast. Um, Pyodide is really different than these past iterations. It's got Python syntax. It's got the Python standard library minus five or six modules. It's got the Python ecosystem. You can pip install things. It has DOM access. It has bi-directional JS interaction. It's got everything. So it really is different. And if you tried some of those past iterations, I encourage you to try this one. Um, when should you try it? Here are four uh, places I think make sense to try it. If you're okay with a little bit of load time, you know, you, TweetDeck is going to die, right? You want to make a Mastodon TweetDeck thing or something? I don't know. You could build it in Python. Uh, if you want sandboxing, no better sandbox than the, than the user's browser, if you ask me. If, uh, I don't know if I'd use it for graphics. I'm just not there yet. 
Um, and then if you do want to use the numerical Python ecosystem, it's right there. It, import NumPy. It works. So let's ta talk about how you would actually do that. If you're going to build a custom app like Glompad, don't. Glompad, number one. <laughs> Anyways, but uh, if you're going to build something totally custom, PyScript is probably still the best way. I would still start with PyScript again. Um, it's got pretty good docs, and uh, it's pretty easy to get started. They host it on a CDN. You don't need to install anything. You could even run it in something like JS Fiddle. So you could jump in right now. Um, PyScript.net for the docs. If you just want to say you did, and you don't want to visit Glompad, if you just want to say you ran Python in your browser today, check out this thing called Jupyter Lite. And so uh, if you, it lets you run Jupyter Lab in your browser on top of PyIDide. You can import NumPy probably, pip install it at least. And uh, you can also check out this thing called Repolite, which is by the same folks, which lets you do a repl.it thing, but on top of PyIDide. So if you have docs to write, you should probably use Repolite. And this is one last one that I only started using recently, but it's actually blown me away. It's called Panel. Has anyone here used Panel? OK. One person has used Panel. Well, then you're all, like, this is actually the biggest takeaway if you want to run Python in the browser. I imagine most of you don't want to do a totally custom app like Glompad. You probably have a dashboard or something like a form that you want a few fields to fill out and then a Python function to run. All of this panel is the way to do that right now. Uh, it has a ton of widgets, very similar to IPython widgets, except you get bi-directional communication, and you can do a thing that you actually freeze out the uh, Python that you're going to do into a standalone air-gapped HTML file. And it's a bit big, but you can basically have a browser app, a spa, written in Python that is suitable for data science modeling. And I'm going to show you it running in the browser. Oh my god, yes, it's here. So uh, you know, this is like a. I didn't build it. You know, thank you very much. But I didn't build this. The, the colors are too nice. Okay, so uh, this is a stock portfolio optimizer. It uses the max sharp ratio, uh, and so it tells you if you have an efficient portfolio. You can select some stocks over here. If we say like just IBM. It's going to tell me to sell, sell, sell. Uh, and you know, I, I can run this analysis, 4,000 random samples, and then it like, you know, shows me the things here. And it's running Python in the browser. So um, I mean, boom, sell. Don't, use, don't buy IBM. I don't know. It, it, actually, it actually runs, the code is up on the Holovis site. I highly recommend checking out the rest of their gallery. This is just the most colorful one that I could fit into my presentation. So um, Holovis panel, highly recommend. Uh, OK. So I think with that, visit Glompad, yak.party. Um, my blog, talking a little bit more about this stuff, is on sedimental.org. Um, I've got a GitHub. I've got a Twitter. I've got a Mastodon. And uh, that's my talk. Yeah, you've been a great audience. I wasn't watching the time. I don't know if we have time for Q&A. Probably not, right? One or two questions? Chris. Oh, Glom? So yeah, the question is that he actually has a, an ugly uh, bit of data that he wants to process. Um, like, where can he find out more about Glom? Uh, Glom.rtfd.io, or just Google Glom Docs. It should come up. Um, or go to Glompad, and it's all linked from there. And you can paste your data into Glompad, and then uh, manipulate it in real time and, and, and sort of see the errors as you go. Uh, yeah, that's the reason for the season. Great question. A little bit soft. <laughs> A little bit soft. I appreciate it, though. Yes. Uh, sure. So the expressive power of Glom had Glom's own internal language. Very interesting question. So uh, the string version of what you see in Glom is really just a hook. 
it only allows you to traverse paths and get back single values. The key to Guam's like power is its Python nat nativity. So uh, every Python object, in effect, is itself a Glom spec. The Python, sp like the Glom spec, is a Python object. So you can have specs which are dictionaries, lists, tuples, sets, you name it. It is a valid like Glom spec. So it's sort of like you're giving an, a data traversal or transformation AST as a Python object, and so. Um, yeah, there's no like uh, LR1 aspect to that. Yeah. Yes, Neil. Mm -hmm. The first REPL was PDP1 on a PDP1 computer, one of those big ones, uh, using Lisp. Which Lisp? Common Lisp? No, it's uh, some early flavor of Lisp. Okay. It's true. It's true. But uh, yeah, I'll, one more or no? All right, one quick one. It'll be a quick one. Okay, then I'll be around. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'll be around and we can do it offline. All right, cool. Well, again, you've all been great, super patient. We covered a lot of ground. I feel like we're all best friends. We'll talk soon. Bye-bye.